This year class will involve the life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from his from just before his birth up until the migration to Medina, which, what is known as the Hijrah. That will be the first part, and that may take somewhere between four to six months. The second part will be from the establishment of the city of Medina to the just after the death of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and that will probably take another four to six months also. It will be an in-depth class, so I do suggest that you bring uh, pencils and paper with you to take notes. I uh, will probably give classes, inshallah. I'm sorry, I'll turn it down just a little bit. No problem. I'm going to probably step away from the mic a little bit. Is this okay now? I'm just step, probably pull back from the mic a little bit, and that may make it a little bit easier on everyone's ears. Okay. So, inshallah, this class will be very in-depth. So, uh, take your notes, inshallah. I do intend to have a few quizzes here and there. And if you have questions... You can always email me or or send them through. Um, usually, send, email is probably the best way for me to get them. Inshallah. So, beginning this class, inshallah, we're going to start off by first trying to understand what is the reason for studying the Sita. What is the reason for studying the life of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? And you got to forgive me. I give a lot of khutbah, so my hands will move around a lot. So uh, that's. We have been trained in giving khutbahs and speeches, so just forgive me if I accidentally knock down the mic or anything. It's just me being expressive with my hands. But understanding the seerah is important for many reasons. For one thing, Prophet Muhammad is our example. He is our example. He's the one that we are supposed to model our lives after. We have to follow him in his traditions and every, as best as we most possibly can. The speech of Allah, the word of Allah, Al-Quran, much of it centers around the life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Much of it is actually based upon things that happened in his life. Even some surahs that you know and say all the time, There's if you, when you read the tafsir, much of it actually has to do with the life of Prophet Muhammad. For instance, Surah Al-Kawthar. Surah Al-Kawthar, we all know it. Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. The translation of that is, uh, Verily we have given you Al-Kawthar, uh, and do not worship, I mean, we have, verily we have given you Al-Kawthar, so pray to Allah and sacrifice, verily your enemies will be cut off. Now this came to Prophet Muhammad as a result of some of the disbelievers, the pagans, making fun of him, saying that his lineage will be cut off because his son died. His son, uh, it may have been for Abdullah, it was for uh, his first son, uh, which was Qasim. Because his son Qasim died, they made fun of him and said that his lineage will end with him. Because he had a bunch of girls, and this was his first son, and his son died. And so they made fun of him, saying that his son died. And that, so therefore, he will not have, his lineage will not go any beyond his own generation. And so Allah was comforting him by saying that even though, uh, for in Allah's wisdom, Allah took his son away, Allah gra- granted him something much better than that in Al-Kawthar, which is a river in Jannah, a river in paradise. So Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was given this gift and this, and this news that he would receive Al-Kawthar as a response, and as a way of comforting him from not only the death of his son, but also from the, the mockery that the pagans put upon him. And as and as we can see, of course, that came out to be true. Of course, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will be granted paradise, we know that. But also... His lineage was not necessarily cut off. It did it did continue on through his daughter Fatima and her sons Hassan and Hussein. It did continue on from there, but not beyond that though. If you look at it today, the name Muhammad is the most popular name in the world, no matter what language you speak. Muhammad is in many people's names, both men and women. You know, so either first name or last name. So his lineage was not cut off at all. Whereas those who made fun of him. Who knows who they are? We have to. I'll have to do some research to kind of try and find the names to find out who who it was that actually made fun of him. So the people who made fun of him actually their lineage was cut off. But this is just an example how Allah how Allah revealed certain parts of the Quran that were based around Prophet Muhammad's life, either directly or indirectly. Another example is Surah An-Nasr. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Ida ja'a Nasrullahi wal Fath. 
وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجًا فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ تَوَّابًا When the help of Allah comes and the victory, and you see people entering into the religion in crowds, فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ Glorify your Lord with praises and seek His forgiveness. Verily, He is the one who accepts repentance. This, uh, according to the tafsir, this surah was actually revealed, basically um, acknowledging or notifying Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam of his impending death. Letting him know that the victory, the help and the victory has come. They are con- the Muslims have conquered Mecca and the help of Allah has come. And now... Allah is telling him that his mission is complete. People are entering into Islam in droves, and now he has to prepare for his own death. His death will be coming soon. It's time for him to prepare for his own death by seeking Allah's forgiveness and by glorifying Allah with praises. So we can see one thing we see is most important is that if Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was advised to seek forgiveness from Allah, <laughs> what does that say about us? But also we can see how chapters of the Quran where revelation came down for Prophet Muhammad or about his life, even about his death, letting letting him know that his death was coming soon and to prepare for it. So this is why, and this is a speech of Allah. So therefore, we see that how important it is to understand the life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because in understanding his life, it will help us to understand the Quran as well. And as you under, and as you learn the Quran and learn the tafsir and the meaning behind the Quran and you learn about the life of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and you learn uh, about hadith, you will see that you know all this, all these things are interconnected. Everything works together. Everything flows together. Nothing stands alone by itself. Tafsir works with hadith, which works with the seerah, which works with the Quran. It all works together. It is all really a, a beautiful fluid understanding of Islam and by enhancing yourself in one aspect of Islam whether whether it is a seerah or the tafsir or something else it will help you understand all other aspects of it indirectly eventually inshallah and so that's one of the most important reasons for understanding the seerah is to get an overall understanding of Islam so with that in hand inshallah we're going to move forward actually into the actual the actual course in and of itself and we are going to start with trying to understand the life of or life of the society that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was born in, the culture and the society that he was born in, in the Arabian Peninsula over 1400 years ago. The Arabian Peninsula is no secret, is primarily desert. You know, he's born into a desert society uh, where people, the Arabs were still mostly nomads. A few had settled down and had begun to uh, build cities like Mecca and Medina and a few others. Uh, Medina at the time was called Yathrib. But for the most part, most of the Arabs of his time were primarily uh, nomads, Bedouins, still traveling from place to place to place. And then a few settled down to establish these cities, as I mentioned. The nomadic lifestyle was very harsh. It's living in the desert, living off the land, living off of animals. You know, you, you know, your ride is also your food. <laughs> your camel is also your food. And so if your camel dies, you may starve as well as be stuck in the middle of the desert. It's a very harsh lifestyle. At the same time, however, it's also very monotonous. Because this harsh and monotonous lifestyle led to two things. For one, it led to a strong dependency upon your fa- upon the family and upon lineage and upon tribal relations. That became a very strong thing because that's all you had. You didn't have a government. As Bedouins, they didn't have a government to protect them. They didn't have police officers and any of that stuff. All they had was their family. So family had to stick together. We, we say that's those things now, but back then it was a reality. Family really did have to stick together and family still together no matter what it's just a, it's, you had to really mess up for a family in ancient Arabia to get rid of you or to disown you but that hardly ever happened blood was seriously thicker than water in the in the traditional Arabian lifestyle and it still is to a, to, to a large extent but especially back then it was very very important family lifestyle was extremely imp- family relations was extremely important because that's once, once again that's all they had but also the monotony the monotony was, you know, you get up, you know, tend the sheep or look for water, move from one place to the other. It was the same thing over and over and over and over again. There was no school. There was no work. Basically, there was work, but not going to back and forth to work. There was very, very little warfare. So every now and then, yes, family, you know, 
warfare will break out, but they were very sporadic and far, few, few and far between. The, you know, people generally died by starvation, dehydration, sicknesses, and stuff like that. Warfare was not really a cause of death before the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Not to say that it was afterwards either. I don't want to get that impression. So I want to be careful there. But it was also a very monotonous lifestyle. People did the same thing over and over and over and over again. And this led to the Arabs becoming very, uh, very involved in poetry. To pass the time, you know, there was no drawing. You know, they didn't have pencils and paper and stuff to draw and stuff like that. What they did have was a very melodic and rhythmic language that could be manipulated and turned in all sorts of ways to create beautiful pieces of poetry. And so a culture of poetry became a culture of poetry became established in the ancient Arabs of the time of before Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, before Islam. And that continued on all the way up until even now. However, the Quran kind of supersedes, really, not kind of, really supersedes all that stuff now. But still, Arab poetry is still very popular even today. But in that time, it was extremely important. Poetry was, you know, hate to pay to put it like this, but similar to the way rap battles were once at one point in time where you could bring somebody low or raise somebody up simply by dissing them in a rap battle. The poetry was similar to that, just on a much higher level. It was a much higher level. The people who, who uh, they would have yearly competitions at the Kaaba for the poetry, and the 10 best poems were etched in gold and hung up on the Kaaba. That's how, that's how important poetry was to them. So then that came as a result basically of not having much else to do in life other than care for the animals and move from place to place to place. But even when the, when the Bedouins eventually settled down, the love of poetry continued on with them. Now, going back a little bit to understand why another reason to understand why the, um, we're, going, we're going to want to focus on Prophet Muhammad's life. We know that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, was a, a, um, a primary example for us. He is, the, he is the only example, he is the primary example we can follow. We can follow the example of the companions as well, but his example was the best of all. And we see this, excuse me, I've got to look something up very, very quickly. We can see his example, the fact that there was no other prophet whose lifestyle was as documented as Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we don't really have much information about the lifestyle of Prophet Isa Alaihi Salaam. And then the next, the most important prophet other than those two is probably Prophet Musa a.s. Now we do have some details about his life. And going back to Prophet Isa a.s. Prophet Isa, even if we did have details about his life, he didn't have a complete rounded life, so to speak. And the fact that he was never married, he never had children, he was never a ruler, he was never, you know, he had his own disciples whom he had uh, some authority over. But, you know, Prophet Musa alayhi salam, he was married. We have more details about his life. Most of it, outside, other than the Quran, most of it comes from the Taurat or the Old Testament. And that's, you know, we know he was born, put into the river, taken in by Pharaoh's family. He grew up in the Pharaoh's family, killed the guy, ran to, ran to Midian, was ra- married uh, uh, Prophet Shu'ab's daughter, most likely Prophet Shu'ab's daughter. Then got, sees a message in the fire, comes back to Egypt, and eventually leads his people out of Egypt. We know that part of his story. We know, we know all those things. And so he did have a, a more rounded life in Prophet Isa alayhi salam. Prophet Musa was a general. He was a ruler. He laid down laws and everything. He had a family. He, you know, he had a much more rounded life, a much more complete life than Prophet Isa alayhi salam or, or in the Old Testament. So we can't really do much with Prophet Musa alayhi salam's life because we don't have the information about it. We don't know how he treated his wife. All we really know is that he got married. Even in the Quran, only mentioned pretty much he got married, and you could, you could infer some things from what the Quran has. But all we know is that he got married, and he had, a, and you know, we know that what he had to do in order to get married had to work for Shuaib for seven years, and so forth and so on. We know those sort of things. Uh, we don't know for sure if he had any children. Uh, I don't know if the Old Testament says it. I really forgot if he had children or not, but I don't know if he had children. I assume he had children because there's a part in the Quran where it says he was traveling with his family. And generally, when someone says family, it means more than just a wife. So maybe he had children when he, before he saw the fire. So maybe Prophet Musa alayhi salam, had children. We saw some of the interaction between him and his brother, uh, Prophet Harun alayhi salam. We saw some of that interaction. But we see very, very little act- interaction between uh, Prophet Musa alayhi salam, and his mother. Or even Prophet Musa alayhi salam and um, Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun, who actually raised him like a mother. We, there's very little a- interaction between there other than you know, when she first found him and took him into, into the Pharaoh's family. 
So for all these reasons, Prophet Musa, alayhi salam, while of course we, we love him as we love all the prophets, we can't follow his lifestyle because we just don't have the information. However, for Prophet Muhammad, for, for, for Prophet Muhammad wasalam, we know how he treated his wife, we know how he treated his children, we know how he treated his companions, we know how he behaved as a minority, we also know how he behaved when he had the, when he, when he had the majority, when he had the power. We know that sometimes he had to have people executed for committing certain crimes, we know that, some, he, we know that he gave judgments for certain things, we know that sometimes he pardoned people for certain offenses, sometimes, you know... We know much more about his life. We know how he, we know how he went to the bathroom. We know his his uh, without getting too graphic. We know how he um, his relationship with his wife, as far as his inti- his intimacy with his with his wives. We know why he married Aisha at such a young age. We know why he married Khadijah at such an old, at such an advanced age. You know, we know all these things much more. We know much more about the life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam than we know about any other messenger of, messenger of Allah. But we have much more information about Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and so we can use that, and use the information to guide our own lives. And we do this every day of our lives. We do this as far as you know, where we dress and the way we live, and you know, we we say the fact that I'm saying Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after his name is because he ordered us to say it. He advised us to say it, and so I'm saying it every time I say his name. We say the same thing, and so this is all just part of the 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 fact that we take Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a role model in many different respects. Now, as far as the, the sources of the Sita are concerned, the primary source of the Sita is Al-Quran, the Quran, the Book of Allah. And I've already told you so far how there are certain surahs, many surahs actually, that are based upon the life or based, based upon certain events that happen in the life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we already talked about that. And so you can see that the primary source is the Quran. You know, there's no... Uh, fault in that. There's no mistakes in that. There's there's no covering things up. If we could cover things up in the Quran, you know, it would be, <clears throat> you know, we'd probably cover up his marriage to to uh, Zainab because there's controversy around that. If there's thing, if, if there's way, to, and that's specifically in the Quran. And so, if Muslims could cover things up, that would be something we would cover up. Or other things that you know, when a lot, you know the. The verse they always say, "Kill them whenever you see them," and stuff like that. You know, we could cover things up. You know, we would cover we would cover all these things that make you know some weak weak Muslims cringe and squirm. You know, we would cover these things up, but you know, we can't. Allah has protected the Quran from now until the day of judgment, and there's no covering up, covering it up. And Prophet Muhammad's life, Prophet Muhammad's life, is chronicled. Much of it is chronicled in the Islam in, in the Quran, both before the Hijra and after the Hijra. So the Qur'an is a primary source of the Sita, the primary source material for the life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The secondary sources would be the six uh, books of Hadith. And I'm going to miss one of them. I know I always miss one of them. But it's, you know, uh, uh, Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, um, uh, Sunan Abi Dawood, Tinmidhi, uh, Ibn Majah. And I guess it's a fifth, the sixth one I can't remember right now. But also Muatta Imam Malik and... Um, Imam Ahmed's Isnad, Imam Ahmed's um, uh, Musnad, Imam, ah- Imam Ahmed's Musnad. Uh, these are the primary sources of Sira after the Quran. Imam Ahmed's uh, Musnad is probably the largest of all the collections of Hadith. It has it contains uh, I gotta look up uh, thousands upon thousands of Hadith. All of them are not authentic, but still, you know, it's still a very good source of of uh, the Prophet's life, as well as, of course, Bukhari and Muslim. Uh, Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim are accepted almost without question. So they're almost, they're not on the same level of authenticity as the Qur'an is, but the level of authentic, authenticity of Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim are very, very high. But all the all the books of Hadith are still important for learning about the life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, when it comes to collecting the Sirah, the rules are not as stringent, they're not as strict and rigid as the rules of collecting the hadith. For the collecting the hadith, the different scholars and imams who collected the hadith, they have very, very, very strict rules. But for the people who collected the Sita and who wrote their Sita books, they weren't as strict. So they were much more willing to take um, to take reports that may not have been as authentic or did not have as much strong or uh, reliable sources behind them as the hadith were. For the hadith, uh, with the exception of maybe Imam Ahmed, you know, the the imams who put those together didn't really, you know, they didn't play any of that. Uh, you know, 
uh, hadith had to be very, very, the sources had to be very accurate, had to be several chains, several chains leading to it, or it had to be very, very strong, you know, unbroken chains, the reporters had to have, had to have the highest qualities, you know, they didn't play with that. But for the Sido, we we're much more rigid with it. And the reason is because the Sido is not used to make rulings, you know. I'm not going to, I can write a, a book of Sita and you're not going to take that and make a ruling of Islam with it. You shouldn't at least. That'd be a very silly thing to do. And, you know, we're not going to make a ruling out of even the other Sitas. Um, for instance, Adahik and Maktum, a very popular Sita, a book of Sita, a Sita that was written. We're not going to take that and make rulings out of it. But the books of a Hadith, we make rulings out of it. We make fatwas, fatwas from that. And so that's the importance of the reason why the level of, um, of rigidity is so much higher for hadith than it is for the seda. So for the seda, we can be a little more flexible with the reports that we take. And but the, with all that, however, there are many, you know, many reports that come through the seda or that come um, about the life of Prophet Muhammad that are just, you know, not really, you know, true. Some of them are just really out there. So we try to at least stick to as much authenticity, authenticity as we can. And may Allah guide us in that. I mean. Now, after the books of Hadith, the next most important source of the Sita would be from um, would be from the companions. The companions, of course, all of their reports were not written in the books of Hadith. You know, sometimes the reports were taken by other people or written down in other books and so forth and so on. So all of the the things that the companions say that may not have been recorded in the Hadith will be the next primary source of Sita. And... This is, of course, obvious. The companions that live with Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they knew him, they fought alongside him, they worked with him, you know, many of the, some of them were related to him, you know, so they knew him. So, of course, we're going to get our, our primary source, well, he, this, the stories of the Sahabas or the reports of the Sahabas that may not be reported in the Hadith, in the books of Hadith, would be the third most important source of the Hadith. And then beyond that, we have the different books written by the Tabi, uh, or the different books reported by the Tabi'een, which are the followers after the, the generation, the students of the Sahaba, and the Tabi Tabi'een, and the generation after them, and all the other scholars who came after them who wrote books. But the primary three sources are, of course, the Quran, the Hadith, the reports of the Sahaba, and then Tabi, the Tabi'een and Tabi Tabi'een. So those are primary sources of the Sita, and... I'm not going to go through all the different, there are many different books of Sira, some of them you may have heard of, like Ibn Ishaq, um, um, Tariq Tabari is a very popular one. Uh, we're not going to, I'm not going to go through all those, but it's just good that you know that there are other sources of Sira if you want to go out and, and find some of them, inshallah. Now the word Arab, we're going back into the, we're going back to the, the, the situation of, of Arabia before the birth of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The situation in Arabia, the Arabia was flanked by two powerful nations. To their northwest was the was the Byzantine or the Eastern Roman Empire. They were the vestiges, what was left of the ancient Roman Empire, but they're still very powerful. They're still a very powerful force to be reckoned with. They were on the on the downside. They were kind of sliding down in history, but they were still probably the most powerful nation in the world at that time. This is kind of like the United States is now. Still very powerful, still a force to be reckoned with, but, you know, you can all tell that things are going downhill. The the other powerful nation were the Persians, the Sassanid Empire. That was to their northeast. Persia, which is now you know, Iran, Iraq, um, several other parts of, um, of, um, of Central Asia, uh, though that was the uh, the next powerful empire, and they were always rival. They were always rivals with the Byzantines, with the Romans. In the Quran, when you in the Quran and in the, and in the Hadith, when you hear the word Romans, they're really talking about the Byzantines, the Eastern Roman, the Eastern Roman empires, and they were they had more of a Greek culture than a classical Latin culture. And I'm going way off point. I don't want to go too far into that because give me talking about history, and I'll go I'll go too far down. So I'm gonna try to keep on point, but. We're talking about when they say Rome in the Quran is really talking about the Byzantines, and that was because they still call themselves Roman, even though they didn't control Rome and they weren't living in Rome. The capital was in Constantinople, but they believed that they were they were they were really the vestiges of the Eastern Roman Empire. So that's why they called themselves Rome, and everybody called themselves Roman anyway, even though they were hundreds of miles away from Rome. Mashallah. Okay, so those are the two primary forces. But there are other forces as well. There's also the Abyssinian Empire. Abyssinian Empire is kind of like a, a, a vassal of 
the Roman Empire because they're both Christian. Abyssinia, is, which is now which is now Ethiopia, uh, they're both Christian nations. Uh, they and the Christianity was very was closely related. The Christianity that was practiced in Abyssinia is um, Eastern Orth. It's kind of like it's called it's Coptic Christianity first of all, but it's very similar to Eastern Orthodox Christianity, which is what is pre- what was practiced in the Byzantine Empire, what is now practiced in, in uh, Russia and the Balkans and places like that. Now there are three different types of Arabs, so to speak. Uh, there are the Arabized Arabs. These are Arabs who are now Arab now, but their lineage they're not they the lineage doesn't come from um I guess authentic Arab stock, I guess. These are people basically people who moved into the Arabian Peninsula and adopted their ways and languages and customs. A primary example of the, of course is Prophet Ismail alayhi salam. We know the story of Prophet Ismail alayhi salam um, his mother was Hajar, who was whose mother was Hajar, who was an Egyptian slave, and who was given to Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. And Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam himself was from Babylon. It was from what now known as Babylon, which is now modern day Iraq. So Prophet Ismail alayhi salam was a mixture of Egyptian and Babylonian. He had no Arab in him whatsoever. But you know the story how um, you know Sarah became. Hajjah became pregnant first, and then she had Prophet Ismail alayhi salam, and then sometime after that, several years after that, uh, Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam's other wife, uh, Sarah, she became pregnant, and, you know, some say, I said this before, I got in trouble, but it's the truth, though. You know, Sarah got jealous, and so Allah inspired Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam to send Hajjah away uh, to to a valley in the middle of Arabia, which turned out to be the beginning of the city of Mecca. And we know the story. You know, Hajjah came there. She went running between the mountains looking for water. She left her baby there. The baby kicked in the sand. And, uh, and she came back. Spring was coming up, which came out, which was, turned out to be uh, the well of Zamzam. And, you know, from there, uh, some nomadic Arab tribe saw them came, and came in and uh, saw that, saw the water, saw the birds flying above the water, and came through, and eventually established a city. So Prophet Ismail alayhi salam, he learned Arabic from these, from these nomadic Arabs, and from that point on, you know, his lineage were, were Arabized Arabs, the people who came from outside of Arabia, into Arabia, and basically, you know, accept, um, took on Arab customs. If you want a more detailed uh, st- you know, detail about the story. I can go into it, but I'm going to assume it's going to take a while to go through it. And, you know, we can do it in the, in the next class if you want to. If you really do want more detail on that story of uh, Hajjad and Ismail al Islam, it, it, is a, it is a part of the Sita, I guess, because it leads all to it. But it's, it's more or less a cl- If we're going to do, you know, Lives of the Prophets, it'll be more, I think it'll be more appropriate for a class like that. And Allah knows best. The other type of Arabs are the pure Arabs. Now, um, these are Arabs who came up from Yemen. Basically, uh, if you ask today, the Yemen, uh, people who come from Yemen speak the best Arabic. And the Arab stock generally flows from, um, generally flows from Yemen. You know, Yemen is the, is basically the source of, of the Arab line, the Arab uh, ethnic group. Yemen is a source of that group, of the source of Arab ethnic group, and Yemenis today still, and everybody seems to say that they speak the best Arabic, and I'm going to have to accept it as, as being the fact, being as being true. So Yemen, uh, the Arabs who, who lineage comes from Yemen, they are what we call pure Arabs. And then you also have disappeared Arabs, and these are people like the Ad and the Thamud, these people who were Arab or lived in Arabia, but no longer, um, there's no, you know, their society and culture has been wiped out, either by punishments from Allah, or, you know, they just died out from other natural causes. But whatever, these are dissipated Arabs, people who lived in Arabia, may have been, had, may have been related to Arabs in some way, but they no longer exist. Now, one of the th- we have to look at the reason. Why did Allah send the message of Islam? Why did he send Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to this desolate nation, to this de- wasn't a nation, but this desolate part of the world, where there was there were no really built up cities. People, most of the population was still walking, you know, traveling from place to place with everything they they own on the back of a camel. You know, it was a very rough, rugged lifestyle. Not why did he send it to some place like like. Constantinople, which had an established city, which had a lot of, you know, high culture, had people who were well read and read, well, very knowledgeable, had huge libraries, had a history going back thousands of years. Why didn't Allah send the message of Islam to that nation? Why didn't he send it to, to, um, to Persia, where once again, 
you know, they were they were Zoroastrians, you know, fire worshippers, but still, you know, Allah could have sent it to them. I mean, they they the Arabs were were, were worshiping idols. They weren't much they weren't much better. So why did Allah? The Persians, however, had once again thousands of years of history. They had a very uh, a very advanced culture and society. Why did Allah send Islam to this group of people who were just a little bit above, who were just barely entering into what we might call civilization? They're barely civilized. You know, they were barely, there are very few nations, I mean, very few cities around. They had no king. They had no established government. Why did Allah send it to them? One of the reasons that some people, some scholars uh, say is that the Arabs, because of the isolation of the desert and because of the difficulty of what, uh, that, present, that was present, uh, presented in con trying to conquer the Arabs or trying to conquer the desert, because it's not necessarily conquering the Arabs, it's conquering the desert that's the problem. Conquering people is one thing, but conquering the terrain is something totally different. Because they were isolated from the from the Persians and the Romans and the Abyssinians, uh, they their culture, even though it was it did have its problems in the fact that there was a lot of shirk, their culture was still they didn't have too many of these other vestiges of these other societies. While the Romans may have been, may have had a lot of high culture and a powerful army and everything, they had a lot of corruption within themselves also. The Romans had a lot of infighting. I already told you how. They had different sects of Christianity within themselves, how the Eastern Orthodox, they broke away from the Western Roman Empire, which was what we now know of as Catholicism. And, you know, they broke away from that. And there are a whole lot of other little things going on. Also, at that time, uh, at this time, the, the, uh, tr the concept of the Trinity was starting to take hold now. Uh, before, I won't say, now I'm going to say necessarily right before, but there weren't too many people who were still following the true teachings of Isa alayhi salam. The Trinity had taken hold. The Roman, the Byzantine Empire was definitely Trinity, but definitely believed in the Trinity for sure. There's no doubt about that. They believed in Trinity back then. They believe in it now. And so the Trinity was was basically established over all of Christianity and the few people who continued to just consider themselves Christian as far as they followed Isa alayhi salam, but they didn't worship him, that was slowly and slowly, slowly dying off. And they, and so by the time, you know, maybe, I have no idea when they completely died off, but by the time Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came around, Trini the, Trini the idea of the Trinity was the primary idea of Christianity. And it's mentioned in the Quran uh, when Allah says, do not, when Allah tells them, do not say three. By the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Trinity had been well established. The Persians were even worse. As bad as the Romans were, the Persians were even worse. The Persians, they were fire worshippers. That's one thing. But their society was rife with immoral actions and immoral deeds. And it was they were just completely, you know, it was just, I won't say Sodom and Gomorrah over there, but it was like Las Vegas. It was just... So the Greeks, who were mostly Christian by now, they are mostly involved in philosophy and debates and stuff like that. And so all of these different things were would have been detrimental to the initial stages of Islam and because these cultures and other societies didn't come into Arabia you know the Arabs were isolated from these corruptions from the factionalism of the Romans and the and the immorality of the Persians and the philosophizing of the Greeks, the, Muslims, the Arabs before Arabia, they were isolated from that. They just had their own problems to deal with. They didn't have to deal with all these other cultural things coming along with. And also, there were still some vestiges of the religion of Prophet Ibrahim, alayhi salam, still there. And, you know, what we know as uh, circumcision. Circumcision, you know, we, we know what circumcision is for boys. This was, at, this was a part of Arab culture even before Islam came. It didn't just come up when Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam became the prophet. The Arabs were getting them, themselves circumcised even before then. This is one, one of those few things that stayed on from Prophet Ibrahim Alayhi Salaam and Prophet Ismail Alayhi Salaam that passed on down to the Arabs of the, of the Prophet's time, even before Islam. So while they may have been worshipping idols and everything, they still had that some of the essence of, uh, of, of, of the religion of Ibrahim Alayhi Salaam, which is, of course, Islam. And also the Hajj was in practice. Now, people were coming to the Kaaba. They were making pilgrimage to the Kaaba for the wrong reason. They're coming there to worship idols and run around the Kaaba neck and all sorts of crazy things. But it was still it still shows that there was 
some vestiges of Islam, of true Islam, still in their practice. A few of them. And even in the Quran says that the Arabs, they, before Prophet's time, they believed in Allah. They called Allah, Allah. However, they believed they had to worship these idols in order to get to Allah. They did not, be they did not believe in an afterlife either. They believed that everything they were going to get was going to come in this life and there was no afterlife. And that's where much of their deviation comes in. Because if you don't, when you don't believe that you're going to be receive punishment or reward in the next life, what's to stop you from acting any way you want to act in this life? Really, what's to stop a person? And we see now, and even going off, getting a little bit on my member right now, but we see now in our own society, as our society becomes more and more secularized and even leaves their own Judeo-Christian foundings, and I'm talking about you know, American society, as they leave, get further and further away from their own Judeo-Christian Judeo uh, as, you know, find foundings and, funda and fundamentals, this, the uh, society becomes more and more corrupt. They become more secular. People begin to stop believing in God, stop believing in Allah, stop believing in the hereafter. They become more and more corrupt, and morality goes further and further down. And this is just a, a, re a part of removing oneself away from being God conscious. And there were certain things that led to the up, that led to these. Um, the Yemen, the, the Arabs from Yemen moving up into what we now know of as, as our Central Arabia, Mecca, Medina, Taif, and the, that area. We all know the story of, um, we may know the story, but we all know the story of the of uh, Ashab al Uhudur, the companions of the ditch. Uh, this is a story where the, uh, I'm not going to get the whole story, but the boy, the story of the boy and the king, if any of you ever got the video from Astrolab or whatever, and saw the cartoon with your kids or whatever, there's a boy who, you know, learned with, who learned under, who was supposed to study under a magician, and he, this is in what is now known, known of as Yemen, supposed to study the magician, but instead he met a monk, he started studying Christianity, uh, studying under the monk, and eventually, over certain events, the entire nation converted to Christianity. The king of that country didn't like it, and so he built a fire and started throwing all the Christians and all the all the people who they were believers. Now, when we say Christians here, Allah called them believers in the Quran. Allah says in in um, in Surah Al Buruj, "Those who make fitna or make trials for believing men and believing women, their punishment will be in the fire." So, if Allah called them calls them believers. And, and this is, you can take it or leave it, but to me, this seems as if they would not be worshiping Isa alayhi salam if Allah calls them believers. You know, Allah would have called them people of the book or something else like that. He called them believers. And so, therefore, and, uh, it would appear that these people, while they may have been followers of Isa alayhi salam, they may have been following Christianity, they're not worshiping Isa alayhi salam. So, these are believers who were killed by this king. When the Romans found out about this, they used their vassal, the Abyssinians, to send an army into Yemen to get rid of the, that king who killed all those Christians. And so the Abyssinians, they sent one of the, they sent two of their generals, and one of, his name, one, of the, one of the generals was named Abraha. They went into Yemen, took over, the king, took over this kingdom where the people were killed, and slaughtered or, or removed the king who was there and established their own gen their own kingdom. And Abraha eventually became king. Abraha built this huge temple, um, and we're going to get into this. He built this huge temple to try and um, attract the Arabs to there, and it was rival. You know, he couldn't pull the Arabs away from making Hajj to the Kaaba, and of course, you know, he gathered the army of elephants and went on and tried to knock down the Kaaba. And we know how that story turned out. But the point is that. After all, this was an example of all the upheavals that was going on in Southern Arabia. And this led to a lot of people leaving Southern Arabia where all these problems were and going up the uh, Arabian Peninsula towards Central Arabia, which is Mecca, Medina, and these places, and establishing themselves there. So this is showing you how certain groups came into the Central Arabia, including including the Arabs. And so the Arabs from the south, the pure Arabs, many of them were moving up to the north up to Central and Northern Arabia to escape the political upheaval and the problems that are going on in Yemen and Saba and places like that. Now, inshallah, um, getting close to an hour now. I've got about 10 minutes. I want to save some time for Q&A. Just want to, one last thing. I Normally, I will have to leave exactly at 3 o'clock. Today, however, I'm, I don't work today, so I can stay a little bit longer. If that's, I don't know if that's okay, if you guys have uh, another scheduling, so I don't want to go over anyone else's time. So if, if, you have, if I have to leave at a certain time, you know, it's fine, inshallah. But I do want to cover one thing. Uh, this may have to wait till next time. But I want to also... Okay. All right, so good. No class before me. So I'll, I just want to explain this one last thing, and then we'll go into Q&A, inshallah. Now, as I mentioned earlier... Arabia, 
or this, uh, the area that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born in was initially founded and established by Prophet Ibrahim Alayhi Salam and Prophet Ismail. And we know, of course, that they worshiped Allah and Allah only. And of course, it's Prophet uh, Ismail, who was the leader of his people at the time when he grew up and after the building of the Kaaba with his father, he was the leader of his people. And of course, he would have taught his people to worship Allah only. So how is it that we get to this point now where just before the birth of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we got 360 idols in the Kaaba. How do we get from one worshiping one God to worshiping 360? How did that happen? Well, the problem with that, the way it happened, it was a gradual process. It didn't happen overnight. I've heard two different, make sure my hand's in the camera, I heard two different uh, theories about how it happened, and I'll go through both of them, inshallah, and then we'll go into the question and answer. The first theory, and the first way it happened was that there was a man named Ibn Nuhay. Ibn Nuhay, he traveled to Syria on a business trip. And when he went to Syria, uh, he saw people there worshiping different idols. And so he took this idea, this idea of worshiping idols and took it back with him to, uh, to Mecca and to the Kaaba. And that practice from there spread from him onwards to everybody else. And over the generations, everyone was worshiping, worshiping idols after a while. A more detailed explanation that I've heard which kind of makes sense to me also, but it's my opinion that it makes sense. But I, you know, I did hear it from a good source, but Allah knows best. And most likely it's probably a, a combination of both of these factors. It may not be just be one thing over the other. Was that, of course, uh, Prophet Ibrahim and Prophet Ismail, alayhi wasalam, they built the Kaaba. Prophet Ibrahim would come back periodically to visit his son. Eventually he died. Prophet Ismail, alayhi salam, is the leader of a small, growing community of Arabs in what we now, in the Valley of Bakka, later, be known, later, later to be known as Mecca. So, eventually, Ismail, alayhi salam, alayhi salam, will also die, as well as his mother, um, Hajjad, and the people around him. They would all, they would all die. But the, the population of Mecca continues to grow, though. It has this well here. The nomads are tired of wandering, wandering the desert, and they'll come in, and eventually they'll grow. People will have kids. There's no warfare. So, you know, you got this... this um, you got the well here, and people are learning how to trade between Yemen and Syria, and Bundy's coming in, and people are still coming in for the Hajj. So life is fairly easy compared to the rest of Arabia. Life in Mecca is fairly easy. With an easy population and with abundant money and food, of course, will I'm sorry, with an easy life and with abundant money and food, of course, will lead to increased population. There'll be less infanticide, uh, less children, fewer children dying in the first two years of life, and people will naturally live a little bit longer. Now, still, the average, eight, average lifespan back then was still probably about 40 to 45 years old, but still, when everybody else is dying at 30 years old, 40, 45 is not too bad. None, the point is this, that it was a more established society, and so the population grew. As the population grew, people moved further and further away from the Kaaba. And the teachings of Ismail al became more and more in the past. It became more and more of a distant memory. So when people would move away from the Kaaba, you know, they they love the Kaaba and they love the stories of the Kaaba and they loved in the stories of Ismail and his father Ibrahim alayhi salam. And so as they moved away from the Kaaba, they would maybe take a little piece of stone with them, not to worship it, but to remind them of the Kaaba. It was remind so they couldn't revisit the Kaaba every day because they lived so far away. They could probably only visit it maybe once a year. Maybe they could even make Hajj every year. So they don't know when the next time they're going to come to the Kaaba. So they take a little piece of stone with them and take it back with them and they take it to their house and they you know put it in the windowsill or whatever they had back then and you know just as a reminder and so but eventually these people die and then the children will, will, will come along and they see their parents they know their parents have always had this stone and they don't know where it came from they heard the stories about it but they don't really know much about Abraham and Ismail all they know is what their parents told them and they see this stone and so they say okay well Dad always loved the stone. I'm going to love the stone too. You know, remember family lineage, family ties is very, very important. And so dad loved the stone. I'm going I'm to love the stone too. I don't know what it's about, but I'm going to do what dad did. And so he also revered the stone. He didn't necessarily worship it, but he still revered it. He made sure nobody touched it. He polished it every now and then, and, you know, made sure it was always in the, in the highest part of the room. He just made sure that that stone was taken care of. But eventually that generation would die. The next generation would come along. Now, they only know 
they may have heard some stories from their grandparents about Ibrahim and Ismail a.s., but it's even more distant for them. All they know is that their father and their grandfather used to have the stone with them all the time, and they're going to do the same thing. They're going to follow along with the same thing. And so while, while their dad and their granddad, all they did was just, you know, revere the stone and, and look at it longingly and remember the good old days of Prophet Ibn Malay Salaam. This now third generation, you know, they come upon hard times and they go, why did I always look at that stone? He was always looking at that stone. There's something about that stone that's, that's good, something powerful about that stone. And so he would hold that stone and say, stone, if you can do something for me, you know, help me out of the situation. And Shaitan would creep in and give him what he wants. Or Allah will test him and give him what he wants. And then now all of a sudden, now all of a sudden the Aqidah is changing completely. And now he's not only holding the stone, he's actually praying with the stone. He might not be praying to it, but he's praying with it because he feels more comfortable having the stone with him. And then the next generation, now there's a fourth generation, is there great is there great grandparents who knew Ibrahim and Ismail? They saw their father praying with the stone, but they don't know they're just praying with the stone. They for all they know, they're praying to the stone. And so from that point on you have Shirk. And from that point on, it just goes and grows and grows. And the generations that got further and further away from Ibrahim and Ismail alayhi salam, you know, shirk became just part of the life. And this happened for everyone uh, over and over and over. And most likely it was a combination of both of these two factors. Perhaps, you know, cult- people traveling to other parts of the um, of the world around that time and bringing back foreign cultures. And also people, you know, doing, you know, why well, we have to be careful of bid'ah or innovation because... One small innovation has now led to shirk for the for an entire for entire entire generation years later. So, excuse me. <coughs> so we have to be careful about innovation because this is what it can lead to. And so I just wanted to get into that and talk about that for a while. And we're going to talk about some more about the the lifestyle and the religion of and the culture of Arabia, inshallah, in the next class. So now is the time I'm going to open up for Q and A, inshallah. If anyone has Questions, comments, or if, you know, if I spoke too fast, I told you I was raised in New York. I can speak very fast. So if you have anything to ask me, please uh, go ahead. So go ahead through one moment. All right. Uh, first question is, sister is asking about uh, Prophet Muhammad's son, uncle and his family. What religion did they follow? Uh, his from the, what I understand, and shall, what I understand, um, his uncle, you know, he died without taking shahada, and definitely uh, uncle, I mean Abu Talib, because uh, he had other he had other uncles. Um, he had another uncle named Abbas. Um, from what I understand, Abbas did accept Islam, uh, but he just kept a secret. However, his uncle Abu Lahab, you know, he, he was cursed by Allah, so he definitely didn't accept Islam. But primarily, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu family, uh, from what we understand, those who did not accept Islam were idol worshippers also. Um, that they, I mean, there's no indication that they didn't have, um, that that they did anything else. There were some people who who followed a a um, a monotheistic religion called that people called Hanifan or Hanifa, which was based upon the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam. However, other than I can't think of anyone in the Prophet's family who did that before Islam. Uh, I may I know this guy can't think of it does not mean it's not true, but I just can't think of it off off the top of my head right now. So chances are his family followed. Um, by that I don't mean Khadija and his daughters and all. I'm talking about the um, his uncles and his mother, father, and those people. You know, they probably most likely were, were idol worshippers. I mean, they were, they actually, the Hashemite clan was responsible for maintaining the Kaaba. So <laughs> they most likely were, uh, they were the ones who maintained the Kaaba as far as making sure the pilgrims had enough food to eat and everything else. So if they weren't worshiping the idols, they were certainly facilitating the worship of the idols. So they were definitely you know, part of it. I'm certain they were part of it. Uh, Allah knows best, but they're part of it. And also there's a story of um, his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, when, uh, I'm skipping ahead now, it's in the next slide, but basically his grandfather went to a soothsayer. Well, as far as, well, the Arabs in general, they believed in Allah. They believed that Allah existed. They believed that there was a supreme deity, a supreme God named Allah over everything 
but in order to they used idols as intercessors. Right? Uh, next question. Yeah, I'll be going. The battles won't come in. The the next question the sister is asking about. She's a new convert and enjoys the class and wants to know we'll go we'll go deeper into the stories of the battles, and and stuff like and you know things like that. The battles will probably come, inshallah, but they'll be months from now. You know, I haven't even gotten to the prophet's birth yet. <laughs> so and then I've been here for about an hour or so already. I haven't gotten to his birth yet. I haven't gotten to you know generations before his birth. So it's going. This is the deep class. So yeah, we're going. It's going. It's going to come, inshallah. But it's going to come some time. It's going. To, it's going to take some time. So, uh, it may it may be sometime after. I'm hoping to be able to start at least sometime uh, September, October, inshallah. Hopefully, uh, we'll see. Um, I, I don't want to miss anything at the same time. I don't want to rush myself. I mean, um, inshallah. Sister is asking if I'll, I can ask questions from the previous classes, inshallah, and um, so people can stay. Update on it. Yeah, we can do that, inshallah. That's no problem. Um, we can ask questions. I can actually, if you could give me one moment, I can get my iPad real quick. And actually, uh, really, really quickly, I did ask you guys to take notes. So um, I guess we can always do a real quick pop quiz very quickly. And anyone, uh, can you quickly name the? Can you quickly name the two superpowers around the Arabian Peninsula before? Uh, the birth of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right, Persians and the, Byz- and the Byzantines. The Persians, what was their religion? There you go. Yeah, Zoroastrianism. And the religion of the of the Byzantines or the Romans? Yeah, the Romans were, were Christians. Uh, Catholic, not Catholics, I'm sorry. Um, Eastern Orthodox Christian. Uh, name can you name two of the the two primary sources of Sita in order please the first one and the second All right um Quran and then the hadith right Quran the Quran and then the, and then the hadith and this one say may take a little bit of thinking why is why are the um the the prerequisite prerequisites prerequisites oh lord of mercy why is it less why why are the um the stories of the Sita why is it taken why are they not as stringent of on taking the stories of the Sita as they are with taking the hadith uh, for reports in the Sita why is it that scholars are much more lenient regarding which reports of Sita that they'll take compared to how strict and rigid they are with the reports of the hadith why is there such a difference in how much authenticity authenticity we give we give them? Like, yeah, the channel of narration is not always reliable in the Sita and in the had and um there are many hadith that do that have unreliable chains of narration, but what is the primary reason why why uh, a scholar who is writing a book on Sita would be much more lenient with it about taking a certain story about the life of Prophet Muhammad than he would be if he was compiling a book of ha- um, an original book of hadith. Why would he be much more lenient about that? Give it a few minutes. Basically, remember that. Well, the, the reason is because the sira will not be used for a rulings. It will not be used for fatwa. You're not, you're not going to use. You're not going to make a ruling based on a book of sira. But people will make rulings based on a book of hadith. Hadith is the second source of legislation after the Quran. Whereas Sita is not. The Sita the Sita that is reported in the Hadith, yes, that would be. But a book of Sita in and of itself would not be used as a source of legislation.